prophetic promise of the seventh day. 2 Peter 3.8 says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. So from the time of Adam until the turn of the century, we've completed 6,000 years or six days. Now we're early in the morning on the seventh day. Good morning. You know, I've taught that message all over the world as well as the promise of the third day and different things. And the Lord keeps and continues to give revelation. As I see it unfold more and more as the day of the return of our Messiah, Jesus, comes. And um, I want to share a facet of that revelation. Now, there's many directions I could go, but I, I just felt compelled to share a facet of that revelation tonight because this is so intrinsic to walking with God in this hour where upheaval and uh, all these things are coming upon the earth. I mean, we, we better know our God. We better know our God, but more than that, we, if we truly know who our God is and we're in Christ, then we we're not going to be moved by what's taking place in the earth through fear or doubt or unbelief, but we're going to be resting in Him. And we've got to grasp this. Well, I'm going to start out with this. In January last year, we were ministering in... Honolulu, Hawaii. It's a tough place to be in January, but somebody's got to do it. And we were holding a conference up there with the healing rooms, and on the morning session on a Saturday, I had an open vision in front of me. And this open vision, I saw the hands of God holding this huge golden bowl, and in it was a golden liquid, and I kept saying, Father, what is that? What are you saying? Because visions is the voice of God. It's just a facet of the voice of God. So I kept saying, Lord, what are you speaking? What are you saying? And he never said a word. And I, I mean, the, the worship was going, and I'm just looking at the hands of God way up on the platform, holding this huge, massive bowl, and he wasn't speaking. So every once in a while, a drip would come off his right hand. I thought, one of the times I thought, I wonder what that is. You see, God doesn't waste anything. So the next drip, I thought, I'm going to see where that goes. And it formed up, you know, and it, agonizingly slow, and then it dropped. And I just followed it from his hand. And as I looked down, there was the planet Earth, and the drip hit Southern California, and the date 1906, Azusa Street came up. And immediately, God just gave me knowledge. He said, every past move of God has been nothing but a drip, a foretaste, a birth pang of what God wants to do in this hour. And then he, as, as, I mean, this revelation is exploding in my spirit, all of a sudden the Lord went like this. And he poured out the whole of what he held in that bowl. And he said, my glory shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And this generation will see the fulfillment of that scripture. And I, I want to tell you, I was undone. I said, every past move of God was but a birth pang, a contraction, if you will, a foretaste of what God's going to do at the end of the age. Whoa. And I've studied past revivals. I want to tell you, he's done some wild things. You know, I was just reading about the Welsh revival again. Do you know it was not uncommon for the coal miners in the Welsh revival? You know, they'd, they'd get up at 6 in the morning, go to the coal mine, work all day, go home, clean up, have dinner, and then which was a couple mile walk, and then they walked two or three miles off to the church, and they'd be up there till almost one in the morning. Well, you know what began to happen? They were so impassioned for the Word of God and the God of the Word that they'd step out their door and immediately be at the church. And when they left the church, they'd be immediately back on their doorstep, and they just thought that was normal. Footnote, good place for amen. Amen. See, when God begins to move, what's normal is what we call abnormal when God's not moving or supernatural. But we can live in the realm of the supernatural. So what is once, look, that should be our norm. We're born into the kingdom of God, not an addendum to the kingdom of God. We're born into that kingdom. We have access to all that he is and all that he has. 
but we've got to grow up. We've got to grow up. I, I'm just going to hit this quickly. You know, in the Western church, in Western culture, we just don't, we do not understand covenant. We do not understand intimacy with God. And we think once we're born again, that's it. Every promise applies to me. As soon as I'm saved, I can say I'm a son of God. Well, that's not correct. Well, what do you mean? No, that's, in fact, God's calling those things that are not as though they are. That's the direction he's taken us. But if you understand covenant in Hebrew culture, the four major covenants, the first covenant is the blood covenant. Do you know the blood covenant is the only covenant that has to be renewed daily? Daily. That's why Paul said, I die daily. Now, you study this in the Hebrew. We've got this gospel of the greasy grace out there that says, I can confess my sins once when I get saved, and it's okay because he's forgiven everything I'll ever do, so I can do whatever I want. That's a lie from the pit of hell. That's a doctrine of demons. And believe me, the flesh loves it. That's why it's gaining momentum in the earth. But I want to tell you something. They're going to be jerked up short very quickly when they find out that just doesn't work. But the truth is, the blood covenant must be renewed daily. And by the way, in Hebrew culture, wine speaks of blood. So that's why in communion, we take that as a, a type of the blood of Jesus. You're a believer. You should be doing communion every day. Well, you're the priest of your own temple. Put yourself in remembrance of the awesomeness of God and the love of God by receiving that every day in your own private devotions. It'll change your life. Then the next covenant was the salt covenant. Salt speaks of friendship. Now listen, in every one of these covenants, God, there's an initiator and a respondent. God always initiates, but you must respond. And he doesn't initiate all four covenants at one time. There's a progression, a growing up in two. You know, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, you know what they basically did? They gave God a writ of divorcement, said, that's it, we want to follow this one. And God immediately began to reestablish the rebridal relationship with Adam and Eve by slaying an animal, offering up blood, and clothing them in the animal skin. In the Hebrew, that word for that animal skin spoke of the first layer or the undergarment of a bridal garment. See, you, we have to understand about covenants. We have this mentality, the Greco-Roman mindset that we learned in Bible college. We've had it in the Western world that we have an Old Testament and a New Testament. Therefore, because of our Greek leaning and understanding, we can talk about a legal document called a last will and testament. So when you have a last will and testament, if you change it, it supersedes what just went before. That's gone away. Now we have a new document or a new testament. That's not the Hebrew culture or the understanding from that word. We have a covenant. The best way to say that is that a covenant is progressive and it continues on and adds to it. It doesn't do away with. It brings greater latitude or understanding of what's gone before. So it's progressively increasing. You have an old covenant and a renewed covenant. Not an old covenant and a new one, but an old covenant and a renewed covenant. It's still valid. And we've heard it taught forever. No, that's under law. We're under grace. That's no longer in effect. That's a lie from the pit of hell. That keeps you from realizing the significance of the fullness of covenant we actually have in Christ. I've heard, you know, when I first got saved, I heard it. Well, brother, God won't do those miracles anymore because that was old covenant. Those will never happen again. But something in me went, no. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you know what? He's doing those miracles throughout the earth. He's doing those miracles. And so the salt covenant was interesting. In, in those days, Hebrew men would carry a, a, a little pouch of salt. And if, if Mike and I wanted to enter into this friendship covenant, we would get together, we take a little salt from his pouch and mine, put it in a bowl, we take bread, dip it in, and eat it. You know, that, that only had to be entered into once. It could never be broken or rescinded. It's eternal. The blood covenant's renewed every day. The salt covenant, or friendship, was forever. The only way if you wanted to dissect this. The only way that could ever be broken is if you regurgitated what you ate, 
crystallized the salt, separated out the grains, and put them back into the original pouch. Good luck with that one. So it's eternal. Now listen, they're a friend now, but guess what? Being a friend does not negate being a servant. It was an addition to, it was an adding on. You might be the friend of God now, but you're always going to be a servant of God. You can't say, nope, that's gone. It doesn't happen that way. It doesn't work that way. Jesus, the son of the living God, was still a servant. Why are you any better? The next covenant, now, see, initiator responded. God initiates all of these covenants, so there's a progression in your spiritual walk. I talked about that yesterday, about there's a, there's a process we all go through. There's a process or a progression when it comes to covenant. So we enter as a servant. We enter into the blood covenant, understanding we're servants of Christ. And Jesus and the Word begins to shape us and conform us to the image of His Son. And at some point in that progression, He chooses to enter into friendship covenant with you. And then, however long God deems it, at some point, He initiates your inheritance covenant, or the sandal covenant, which called, means you're now a son of God. You see, to say when I first get saved, I'm a son of God, no, that's where God wants me to go as I walk out, work out my own salvation. But at this point, I'm a servant. Eventually, I become a friend. And when God initiates, I can become a son. That means I've reached a level of maturity that he can trust me with the stewardship and the inheritance that belongs to a son. Is it possible, church, that sometimes... Some prayers don't get answered because we haven't entered into a relationship to the extent where we know him well enough to know his heart, to know his word, and to receive that type of inheritance or that type of release from God. I believe it's true. Now look, is it, do you think that a servant has the same privileges as a friend? No. Come on, let's be honest. No, my friend has a lot more latitude in my life and a lot more privileges than somebody at a store that's waiting on me, that's acting as a servant. Do you understand? Well, what about, do you think a friend has as much latitude as a son? No. So the progression is, first we start out in need of tutors. God begins to train us up. God begins to instruct us in righteousness. He teaches us to serve, to have a servant's heart, to walk in that atmosphere of serving him and serving others. And then at some point he initiates, let's have a, be friends. When he initiates that, you have an intimacy that you've never had with Christ. It's, boy, it's like falling in love all over again. And it's just, wow. But you're still a servant. But you're a friend. I call it kicking it with Jesus. Hanging out with God. Friend. But at some point in your spiritual growth and journey, you come to the place where he adopts you as a son. Now you have authority as a son. It's awesome. Guess what? There's more. Because after that, you can become a bride. Come on. I mean, you know when a young man and a young woman is in love, it's just googly eyes and all they can think about and all they can talk about and all they can dream about is that one. Well, you know what? That's the way it is with Christ. He has googly eyes for you. He just thinks about you all the time. He talks about you to the Father and the angels. He dreams about when he can come and get you and bring you home. But he doesn't think that way about a servant. Now, the truth is, that's extended to anybody that's born again. We have a progression. Do you know any... And by the way, that marriage covenant is called the Ketubah. It's reflected in the first five books of the Bible called the Torah. Because a Ketubah always had five parts. As a matter of fact... 
If you understand the bridal covenant or the ketubah, you'll understand the book of Revelation because it's the unfolding of the bridal covenant, the ketubah. That's Hebrew culture. That's not Greco-Roman mindset that says it's all Western-oriented. Totally different. So there's a progression in our lives of growing up into Him. And if you don't submit yourselves to the process, you will never, ever be part of the bride. Remember, the blood covenant, when God clothed them, that was the first layer of a bridal garment. The bridal garment had four layers of fine linen. Do you know in a Hebrew wedding that the guests to the wedding, at the door, they would hand them a white garment so that they could come in because that spoke prophetically of purity and holiness in the, in the marriage. If they tried to get in without a garment, they'd be thrown out. Friend, how did you get in here without a garment? Get out. So guests had one layer, servant covenant. The bride had four layers. She progressed through covenant to become the bride. You choose who you're going to be. God's desire is that we all grow up into him and become part of the bride. But you've got to choose. Amen. And you know what? There's not much more time to choose. Let me, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not even teaching this tonight, but here I am. In Genesis 6, 3, it says that God's spirit would not always strive with man. He was talking to Noah. So he said, I will number the years of man to be 120. And so we've heard a lot of people over the years believing God to live to be 120. Well, that's good, if you want to. No. Nothing wrong with that, but I want to tell you something. If you understand the Hebrew and what's really being conveyed there, God told man he would give him 120 jubilee cycles. Let me say that again. 40, every seven years, we have a cycle. 49 years completes, and then we have a jubilee. 50 years. 50 times 120 equals 6,000. We're early in the morning on the seventh day. See, God's Spirit's not always going to strive with man or vindicate and justify man. He's not always going to cover them and cover their sin, but he's going to have an end to that, and it's 6,000 years. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we're in a season, a window of time that we can choose right now to follow God or stay where we're at. It doesn't, matter. It doesn't mean you're not saved, but I don't know about you, but I want to be part of the bridal company of believers because the privilege is extended to a bride even a friend doesn't get or a son or a servant. Intimacy with Jesus. That's the ultimate. That's the ultimate. That's what you're created for. So God was speaking to me about, I mean, there's so many things. Well, let me say this also in the book of Daniel. Daniel's 70 years. We can talk about the 49 weeks and the 70, whatever. That's good. 70 jubilee cycles equals 3,500 years. Daniel was 2,500 years after Adam. That equals 6,000. Again, I'd have to teach on this for a, a week to get all of this information in. But I want to tell you something. We're right on top of the most profound moment in history. And we have choices to make, and we can't be playing at this thing called Christianity. I, I'm just, I can't say it any straighter than You're either in or you're out. It's all or nothing. Stop compromising with God. You can't do it. It's not going to get you anywhere. So when God showed me this bowl, he began to speak to me. Haggai chapter 2, verse 3 through 9, it says, Who is left among you who saw this house in its first glory? Who of you saw the Smithton outpouring or the Pensacola revival or the Toronto blessing or all of these? See, we look at that and we measure where we're at and go, Man, well, I wish we could have that again. No, you don't want that again. That was a birth pang. That's a drop. Quit looking backward and think you're going to move forward into your destiny. Recognize what God did. Understand what he was saying. 
through those movements, but know that it's pointing to a greater day. And if we're always going to be driving forward, looking in the rearview mirror, somebody's going to get in a wreck. Follow him, because what's before you is far exceedingly above all that you could ask or think. It's beyond comprehension what God wants to do. He said, how do you see it now? Is it as nothing in your eyes in comparison to it? Yet now strengthen, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Strengthen, O Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest. Strengthen all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work. I don't like that. I got saved, darn it, so I don't have to work, so God will take care of me. Foolishness. Let me tell you something. If you're born again, you should do everything with excellence so that you stand out among a crowd and they can say, why do you do such good? Well, I'm a Christian. I do this as under the Lord. Rather than saying, don't hire a Christian because they expect everything for nothing. And I want to tell you, that's the mentality in most places. But if you're a Christian, you should invest your life into what you're doing to honor him. Do it with excellence. Here's why you can do that. He says, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I covenanted with you when I got you out of Egypt or out of the world. You can do the works of God and you can do what God's called you to do because he's with you and his word is truth. That's the only reason you can do those works. Because apart from him, you can do nothing. And so we've got to grasp what God is saying in this thing called the Bible. I, I just don't know how Christians get by with never picking up the word. I get on, folks, you know, because I've been to a lot of churches where they put the scriptures up on the screen and nobody brings the Bible. I said, shut it off. Shut it off. Bring your own sword. Quit depending upon somebody else to feed you. That's not very nice. Yeah, I know. Bring your own. Good heavens. Get in the Word. I, I love to see worn out Bibles. I like new Bibles too. Because I can wear them out. Then he says this, you can do it according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Now, there's a lot in that. If you're doing what God's told you to do, according to the commandment of God, his spirit remains within you because his spirit's are with you. His spirit's not grieved. But you know when you grieve the Holy Spirit, he just takes a step back. He takes his, go ahead and do your own thing until you crash and burn and cry out for mercy again. Amen or oh no. That doesn't mean you're not, that means you're just like all of us, you're growing and learning. and under, but, but you know what, when you grieve Holy Spirit, have fun. Muddle, muddle, muddle. But God is with us. And then he says this, do not be in awe. Now you, in the, you know in the Hebrew, that, that cannot, there's, there's no translation in, e, in English that does that justice. Do not be in awe. Uh, the, a little bit closer would be, don't you even think about it. See, he's saying, listen, stop being in awe of what's going on in the world and what the world's doing. Don't even think about walking in fear of what's happening in the world. Because he's given you a covenant and a promise. And his word is true. And it's sure. And it's a foundation that cannot be shaken. So quit being in awe of what's happening in the world. Rather be in awe of him. You know, he told me years ago, the last great move of God will be holiness, purity, and the fear of the Lord. We're looking for people rolling on the ground and, you know, all these past revivals, whatever. I'm not a, you know, God moved in those, but there's coming a holiness, a purity, a reverence, a fear of God because he's coming back for a church without spot and blemish. And if you don't walk in the fear of the Lord, you ain't that. There's no respect. You know, I've only seen it on the rare occasion in my life where the tangible presence of God was so saturating and permeating a place that people walked in and <gasps> tiptoed because there was such an awe and a reverence. Ooh. You don't see that hardly at all. <laughs> well, boy, we're about to see it. 
If you're hungry for Jesus, if you're hungry for the move of God, that's what you're going to see. It's not going to be this slappy, happy, clappy stuff. There might be some of that, but I'm telling you, at first he's going to introduce us to a holy God that will command respect because when he comes in like that, the terror of God grips your heart and you fall over like dead men. Look, I want to tell you, the fear of God is, you know, in my own life, I've had many, God's graced me with a number of, many of visitations, and, and um, I don't take them for granted. But, you know, I've known Jesus as my healer. I, I, he came in one time and poured this ointment over me and just brought healing to my soul. I've seen him as my best friend. I mean, we've, we've had fun and laughed. I mean, he's got a great sense of humor. Just look at the person next to you. And then, I mean, I, I've seen him as the commander of the host, very regal and powerful. I've met him as the king. And I'm going to tell you, the, the fear of God, I almost died. As I saw him standing on the throne, and I saw a cup there, and this is in the midst of a revival in Seattle, and I had been invited to come, and here's this vision. Here's Jesus standing next to the throne. Here's a cup on a small pedestal, and he said, Tell them! And I went, And I almost fell over dead. I mean, it scared me to life. I've never met that, that fearful, that awe-inspiring God, and I'm going to tell you, every atom of my body trembled in... And I was like, dude, what did I do to you? <laughs> but it wasn't that. He's, a, he's an awe-inspiring God. But he manifested himself in his majesty as a king. <laughs> and the church is about to awaken to that reality. It's about to awaken to that. Here's what he said about that. Tell them the cup of their intercession is almost full. And when it's full, I will pour it out on the earth. And it will accomplish what it's been sent to do. That's a word to you. Then he says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I'll shake the nations. And the precious gift of all nations will come. What's the precious gift of all nations? Well, silver and gold and precious... People! Get out of the world and into Christ. It's people. You know, the word says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So what do you think is treasure to God? Little gold nuggets and pavement? Gemstones, that's the bottom of the river of life. What, what treasure to God is people. Amen, amen. I want to be like my daddy. Woo! What he loves, I love. What he hates, I hate. People is treasure. He said, I'll shake the heavens and the earth and the sea, and, and I'll shake the nations, and the precious gift of all nations will come. That's why tribulation comes on the earth. It shakes it, and people begin to recognize there's nothing but God. That's why America is about to get shaken, like it has never been shaken, so that the lukewarm, lackadaisical church will wake up and cry out to God, and then multitudes will come into the kingdom. And then he says this, I shall fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. What house? When he shakes all nations, when he begins to do this, his glory is going to fill the house. Now let me tell you something. Stop thinking of this as the house. You're the house. He's going to fill you with glory. And the glory of this latter house will far supersede that of the former. Because it's the end of the age. And then he goes on to say, the silver is mine and the gold is mine. And we go, ah, oh, cha-ching. Here we go again. No, silver speaks of sanctification and redemption. When God fills you with this glory, you're going to be able to speak the word of God and see multitudes in the valley of decision come in and be sanctified and redeemed. Gold speaks of holiness and purity and the fear of God. That's the last great move of God. Here we are at the end of the age. God is beginning to shake the nations. This year is going to see shaking like we have never witnessed before. I'm telling you, get ready. And don't fear this stuff because we're part of a kingdom whose foundation cannot be shaken. 
I don't care if the rest of the world is falling down around you. It's not going to come nigh you. Only with your eyes will you behold and see the reward of the wicked. But be established in Christ. And let me tell you, multitudes will run to you and say, why are you not moved and shaken when all this is happening? Because I'm part of a kingdom that can't be shaken. A lot of you know Henry Groover. You ask Henry Groover about Japan and the things that happened in Japan. The morning of that earthquake and tsunami, he was ministering, and the Lord said, get out of Japan and leave now. He got in a vehicle, a tag, went all the way to the airport, said, I want to leave. I want to get on that airplane. And they said, no, you can't. We closed the door. He said, but I can. And he quoted some obscure international law, and they had to open the door and let him out. An hour later, there was an earthquake and a tsunami that wiped out where he was. He came back six months later to that region, and it was like Hiroshima all over again. It's just devastation for 22 miles. And he's walking down the beach looking at this, and, and he see a house standing, and he thought... I'm going to go up to that house. And he went up to the house and he knocked on the door and a person opened and they were Christian. <laughs> Their house was not destroyed. <laughs> and that happened over and over again. The places that were left standing were homes of Christians. Yes. Yes. Amen. <laughs> then they were moving towards where the nuclear meltdown happened on the, uh, those things. It, they had a Geiger counter, and the, the people are with him said, Brother, we, it, he said, we got to leave. We can't do this. He said, in the name of Jesus. He put his hand on the Geiger counter. He said, I command the radiation to cease. And they kept walking. I don't know what kind of God you serve. <laughs> That's my God. He can do anything. Besides, what's the worst the world can do? Threaten you with heaven. He's going to give peace in this place. The glory of this latter house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts, and I will give peace in this place. Peace. Oh, peace is so enticing, so... See, when you're facing trials and tests and temptations, when the peace of God there is there, it's... I shall not be, I shall not be moved. You know, let me, let me, let me show you what I want to do. So I, the Lord was speaking to me about this. He said, I'm about to do this in the earth now. It's not because my people have been asking me for this, because they don't know what they're asking for. It's not because darkness is getting worse. It's because I have set an appointed time, and that time has come. And what God determines to do, no man can thwart. So whether you're ready or not, here it comes. Here it comes. I want to tell you, in a very short time, this place will be packed. You better start getting here early. I'm telling you, this place will be full to overflowing. You better start getting here early. Not because Mike's a good preacher. He's a profound teacher and a preacher. It's got nothing to do with that. Because if that's all it had to do with, it would have been full already. It's got to do with God removing the scales off the eyes of people when they finally come to understand, wait a minute, there's a gospel of truth and there's a gospel of mammon. And the gospel of truth is the only thing that's going to help me through this season. Get ready. Standing room only. You know, he's breaking you in easy with three services a day. <laughs> Try 24-7, 365. Job 8, says, 8 7 says, Though your beginnings were small, your future will be very great indeed. So as I was pondering this and meditating this and, and reading the word, and the Lord said, turn to the book of Chronicles. I, fall, I call them first and second cronies. You know, we're old friends, cronies. Never mind. And as I was reading it, I came upon a verse that just impacted me because revelation just exploded in my spirit. 
1 Chronicles 22.9 says, Behold, a son will be born to you. Now, this is Samuel prophesying to David, King David. And he's saying, A son will be born to you who shall be a man of rest. And when I got to that, I went, Whoa! You see, seven, seventh day, the number seven means rest. Covenant promise fulfilled in completion. See, there's going to be a man born, a man child, a people, a generation that's born unto God that will come to the place of rest. We're going to be people of rest. People of rest. Listen, the word says that there shall always be a descendant of David seated upon the throne of David. That would be Jesus. The promise is eternal. Now, he said his name will be Solomon. But there's a prophetic as well as a literal in that. There's also four levels of revelation in each Hebrew word, not two, literal or figurative, according to the Greek. But there's a generation that's going to know what it means to enter God's rest, ceasing from our own works. Ceasing from our own works. God's birthing a generation of people that are striving to enter that rest. Wait a minute. Rest, strive. Strive, rest. doesn't compute. Yeah, it does. We have to fight a battle right here to stay in the place of rest. Oh my goodness, what am I going to... Be still. Casting down imagination. You know, so many people prophesy or predict their own future by the anxiety and the fear that's in their life. Oh no, now this is going to happen and that's going to happen. You know, I've talked to, to so many people when we were pastoring and tried to counsel them and encourage Finally one day this, this person's just going on and I said, well, sister, I just agree with you. What do you mean? Yeah, I think all that's going to happen. I agree with you. What? Well, that's all that ever comes out of your mouth. Why do I want to fight your will? I agree with you. I said, change your mind, change your confession, change your life. And don't come in here whining and complaining and expecting me to coddle that foolishness. Get in the word and speak that. I didn't have too many people I counseled. Because they don't want the truth. They want to be stroked. Oh, you poor thing. That's not a prophet. Prophets are black and white. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Cry me a river, build a, bri build a bridge, and get over it. Love. And so, let me read this. Behold, a son will be born to you who shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all of his enemies around. Ooh. Does that mean I'm never going to have a battle? No. You have lots of battles. You're just not going to be moved by it. You're going to be at rest. Remember Jesus going across the lake to the island of the Gennesaret? He entered the boat and told his disciples, let's go to the other side. So they start across, and what's he do? He goes to sleep. He's at rest. While the storm comes, and they're freaking out. Yeah, these sailors know their stuff, right? But here's wind and waves, and the boat's being inundated, and they're, they're terrified. Quick, make the master. Don't you care? He stood up and rebuked the wind and the waves, and he said, where is your faith? You know what's interesting about that? He didn't say, oh, you have little faith. He said, where's your faith? I've given you authority over this. Why aren't you using it? Take it out and apply. Well, he was modeling rest. See, he had a sure word of God. We're going to the other side. That's it. I'm going to sleep. He didn't care about the circumstance. The worst storm in the history of the lake could have happened. And he'd have been asleep because he knew the word of God said, we're going to the other side. Hallelujah. See, you've got to know the word of God. I can do some things through God who strengthens me. Yeah, but we live like we can only do some. I have the mind of Christ. <laughs> Use it. Because you're using yours far too often. 
No weapon formed against me. Well, except for that one. I mean, that's a big one. So we either believe God or we don't. Oh, by the way, covenant. As we progress and we become a son, we walk as a son. We talk as a son. We respond as a son. We have authority as a son. We're not moved. That means there's a progression. You know, I, I was, I've asked God since I was 17. I, I, this, this used to bug me no end. I see people come up for prayer and this, and you know, we've all heard and seen this. They didn't get healed. Well, brother, you don't have enough faith. Sit down. What? I mean, even at 17 years old, I'm going, they don't have enough faith. They're coming to you in faith. Lazarus didn't have any faith. I mean, I was confused, literally. I was like, what? Well, then, oh, that one needs to be delivered. Everybody pray real loud in tongues. Chaos. Stand them up. Sit them down. Make, get a bag to vomit. Do this. Where do you come up with this foolishness? Jesus just said, be still and come out now. And so I would go, I was looking for that for years. God, where are your, where are your people that know authority? And we have great teaching on authority. 47 steps to being delivered. That's authority? That's ex no wonder why you come away exhausted. It took 27 hours to get them delivered. What in the world? Jesus spoke, it was done. And I've been saying for years, Lord, why don't we see that? He said, well, <laughs> oops. I know what he was saying. Well, you want to see it? Do it. So, okay. I said, what? whatever, I'm going to do it. I don't care. I think I told you this testimony before. We were in a conference. I was sharing this, and they're looking at me like, what does that mean? I said, look, has anybody here got pain? And this guy in the front row went, oh. I said, what is it? He said every morning for the last three years, he'd wake up, and his, his feet would be locked in place, just agony. And it took him hours to walk out. I mean, he'd be weeping because it was such agony. He'd been to the doctors, got the cortisone shots, and nothing worked. And I said, brother, how are you going to know you're healed? He said, tomorrow when I come to the session, there'll be no pain. I said, go in peace. Your faith has made you whole. I said, see, that was easy, wasn't it? And people are going. <laughs> the next morning he came. I, I just said, brother, here's the microphone. Tell him what happened. He said, I woke up this morning and there was no pain. Amen. I went. <laughs> I said, that's cool, God. He said, you ain't seen nothing yet. I like it. I like it. You see, we've got to go through this show. I think it helps bolster us a little bit so we build enough faith to believe. But, but why? Jesus just said, be healed. Go in peace. Go and sin no more. Be still and come out. I like that one. People think you're nuts. Be still and come out. And you, okay, we're done. And they're going, wait a minute. Wait, what, what, you know, we've got to wrestle. No, it's done. And they're shocked. Well, you know, I like shocking people with the Word of God. I like shocking people with the God of the Word. Live knowing it's true. Not as if, because it is. Live knowing it's true. And when you speak, when spoken through, it's done. Ancient rabbis in the Talmud said the Lord actually had an act of creation on the seventh day. He created rest so that you would have something to enter into. That's what they believe. Well, this is the seventh day. Why don't we contend for the prophetic picture that God's painting for us in his word about the seventh day? Let's enter into his rest. Let's cease from our own works. Let's stop with the church programs. Let's get on our knees and get revelation and strategies from heaven and watch what God can do. It's not going to be by might, not by power, but by his spirit. It's the only thing that's going to work. Now, here's what happens if your foundation in Christ is rest. It says in 2 Cronies 1, 7, in that night. Now, I love this. You see, nights, the Hebrew day began at sunset. But night in type also speaks of the end of the age. So he's saying in that night or at the end of the age, God appeared to Solomon. Do I need to say that again? 
the end of the age. If you're at rest, it's easy for God to appear to you because there's not all that... There's quietness. There's no interference. I mean, we're, we're, they're broadcasting. You know, you know what interference is. You glitch and bandwidth drops and you lose. No, there's no interference in rest. You hear him clearly. You see him clearly. You respond by the Spirit. You don't react in the flesh. That's why Jesus was always at rest. He wasn't moved by the circumstance. He was moved by the Spirit of God, and he modeled rest. So in that night, God appeared to him. Everybody wants, give me a formula, how I can see God. I'm going to say it bluntly. Shut up. What do you mean? Be quiet. Be at rest. Love him. It's what he's doing today. It's never been easier. It's what he's doing today. Stay at rest. And then God said, ask what I'll give you. I let, picture this. God steps into the room and says, brother, what do you want? Anything you ask. Ooh. Let me get out my list. You know, I've been asking all this stuff for, wow. No, he's at rest. You know what? His spirit man instantly responded. Not his carnal man. His spirit man. Lord, you've given me a destiny. I have a people that I have to steward for you. I need your wisdom. See, he responded immediately to the voice of God while at rest, and it was the right response because it was spirit to spirit. And God said, because you asked the rightly, I'm going to give you what you didn't ask for, what this thing didn't have time to engage and come up with. And he made him the richest man that ever lived. See, when you're at rest, God can bless you. But you're always in a frenzy. You just shut God out. That's why, you know, it's not hard to hear God. It's not hard to hear God. Just get at rest. The more time you spend in the Word of God and with the God of the Word, the easier it is to stay in that place of rest. But if you only dabble a little bit once in a while, good luck with that. And then when something happens in your life, you're going, because there's no foundation and there's no peace and rest. Rest. I love that. So the foundation of rest opens your eyes to see Jesus and receive an impartation to fulfill your destiny. Here's another thing that rest does. 2 Chronicles 1.8. He said, give me knowledge. He said, I'm going to give you that knowledge so you can judge the people. The book of James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him beg and plead. And See, if you're at rest, you say, Father, here's the situation. I need your wisdom. Thank you. Or you can go, what am I going to do? Quick, call everybody you know. Stay at rest. But here's the other thing that happens. A man of rest. In 2 Chronicles 5, 11 through 14, it says, when the priests came out of the holy place. You see, Solomon initiated worship to an extent Israel had never understood before. And from the foundation of rest, when Solomon decreed a thing and said, we're going to worship God. And he orchestrated it. And he said, this is what I've seen God say to do. Do it. The presence of God filled the temple that they couldn't even stand to worship. See, most places you go worship is a... <laughs> yeah, most places you go worship is a performance. We've got to get you hyped so you're in the spirit. What spirit? But when you're at rest and you begin to worship God, there's something that takes place in the realm of the spirit that triggers a response from a God who's looking for those who worship in spirit and in truth. If I'm in a frenzy, if I'm anxious, if I'm thinking about the things of the day and what i got to do tomorrow, and I'm trying to worship God, about, and there's so much interference. If I'm at rest, God responds. In a way we keep crying out for. We want to see your glory. Rest. Quit begging them for the glory. Access what's there. Stay at rest. 
Not only that, when you're a man or a woman of rest, when the foundation in your life, when you strive to enter this rest and you begin to walk in this, it says in 2 Chronicles 7, when Solomon had made an end of praying, the glory of God came in. So they couldn't even stand. Are you seeing a pattern here? Rest is a foundation for the seventh day. Something you and I can access. The previous generations didn't have the the fullness of time season that we have to enter into it. But if we learn to walk in this, if we learn to cultivate this rest by striving with our flesh and casting it down and staying in the place of rest, the limit's off. Yeah, I, I do that all day long. I mean, I start thinking, going, I don't know, shut up. I tell my flesh to shut up. Your flesh has a voice. You, you don't recognize it distinctly because it's the only one you usually hear. So it's hard to tell there's other voices. But your flesh has a voice. Command it to be still. Listen to the voice of God. Focus on God. Rest in God. You know, there was a time in my life, well, I'll just tell you, when I was in the army, God didn't tell me to go in the army, but I did it because I thought I had to take care of a family. And, <laughs> and for four years I said, this too shall pass. You know what? I even had a conflict in a contract because they had to, I mean, they had a breach of contract. There were five of us that had this breach of contract. They told the other four, okay, you can either stay here or get out. And he said, what base do you, where do you want to go? And I'm like, I want to get out. They didn't offer me that. They didn't offer me that. And I said, but God, he said, you gave your word, you keep it. Even though you did it apart from me, you keep your word. And so I would just say, okay, this doesn't matter. It'll pass. So there's times in my life now as God's instructing me and teaching me how to stay and rest that I say, this really doesn't matter in the overall scheme of things. In 100 years, how significant is this? Rest. See, you come up with your own language with God. I've, I've, I'm developing my... But I know when my flesh starts acting up, I say, this really doesn't matter. In the light of eternity, this is so insignificant, it doesn't even exist rest. The only thing that I'll take away from any experience is the character of Christ formed in me. Because every experience gives me an opportunity to respond according to the word or the flesh. So I choose, I choose to stay in rest and respond according to the spirit of God. Am I successful all the time? No. Will I be? Yes. Nobody's perfect. That's true. But that's not going to stop me from working towards it. I'm in Christ. I don't know how far a man or a woman can go in this process, but I'm determined to lead the way and go as far as I can go and be a man of rest. Because the world's going to need you in rest. The world's going to need you in rest. Amen? Amen. Father, Teach us to stay in rest. Teach us, Father, in this hour, in this fullness of time season, that we have access into the very presence of God where there's peace and joy. Forever. We can have it here. There's rest. Rest. Lord, it's time for mature sons and daughters to come forth. Those who have come through the phases of covenant into the place of inheritance that are prepared to become the bride, that we would model something as a generation, not an individual, but as the church corporately, of what it means to be sons and daughters of God, not a religious organization, not a movement but an eternal embodiment of a living God that manifests the character and the nature of God, that the world will be without excuse. Keep your people in this place, Father. Give them peace and rest. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father.